If you have questions about budgets for other agencies or opportunities, feel free to bring those up. Um, and if I can answer them, I can. If I can't answer them in a timely manner, we'll take it offline. Um, I, I'm, I'm a pretty casual presenter. So Shelly, are you gonna monitor chat and if people have questions? Yes, I'll monitor the chat for you first. Okay, awesome. So happy to stop anytime for questions. So today we're gonna uh, first talk about the purpose and importance of budgets. Um, next, we're gonna review the budget caps as they're presented again, primarily by NIH. We'll talk about the three different types of costs in your budget. We'll take a look at some budget documents that are required and then um, I'll hopefully get you started on drafting your budget. Before we begin, um, I like to share some rules for the presentation and all my presentations. And if you've seen me present before, you're familiar with some of these. Um, the first is that there's an exception to every rule that I'm gonna tell you today. So SPIR is a program run by human beings who are granted the authority to make exceptions and they do. Um, so I'm telling you the way the rules are presented and all the guidelines, but you might know a friend who did things differently and it was allowed probably true, but that's where today we're focusing on the rules. Um, and it's important to remember when we talk about budgets that the company is always the primary applicant. Um, so even if we're talking about uh, budgets for research partners or budgets for other outside contributors, those all go through the company as the company is the applicant and eventually the, the grant recipient. Every agency is different, so make no assumptions. Again, we're talking primarily about NIH today. Um, and so what you learn today does not apply to Department of Defense. So don't take what you learn in this workshop and, and um, sit down to do your Department of Defense budget at the last minute and think it's going to apply. It won't. Uh, read the guidelines carefully. Every agency is required by federal law to publish guidelines for every funding opportunity and they're there for you to read them. So read them. Most of the questions uh, today will, the answer will be it depends and it will depend on the specifics of your particular application, sometimes your project, your team, uh, which solicitation you're applying to. So just be patient if I answer every question with it depends. Finally, a lot of times I'll just say SBIR, I mean SBIR and STTR, which is the smaller sister program, if it applies, sometimes it's just easier to just say SBIR. So first, let's look at the purpose and importance of budgets. Um, does your budget really matter? The answer is a resounding yes. The budget is critical for providing sort of evidence and support for your proposal. Um, the idea is that it gives the agency a roadmap of how you plan to spend your, your grant money. Um, you're sort of laying everything out for them. Here's what we're asking to do, and here's the money that we need to do it. It also establishes fiscal responsibility with the agency, um, letting them know that you've carefully thought about how much money is required to complete the project and how you'll spend it. And it's also critically important because it's another way to tell the story of your proposal. Um, and in fact, it should tell the exact same story. They should be telling a parallel story. Some people are numbers people and will go straight to your budget. Uh, when they're reviewing your proposal. Other people like to read the narrative first. So th those two things have to be incredibly in sync. So it's very important. Um, this is just a little visual to show you it's supposed to look like totally chaotic because that's kind of how the process is. Uh, there are lots of moving parts and pieces that go into your application, um, but they should all be driven by your specific aims. So all of those things need to align to support each other and the plan. So your team needs to line up with the budget. If you, if you have a team of five people, you know, the reviewer would expect to see five people in your budget. If you're proposing to do experiments in a wet lab that you have to rent, the reviewer would expect to see a line item in a budget to rent um, lab space for those particular experiments. Um, not rent as a whole. We should, I shouldn't, that's a bad example because it's confusing. <laughs> but um, anyway, your budget should align with what you propose to do with your work. Um, a couple of points, uh, important points about your budget. Um, again, the company is always the applicant. So we make sure you remember that. Um, budget is negotiated at time of award. So when reviewers review your proposal, the question that they're asked about your budget is, is it consistent for the work proposed? Uh, so they're not necessarily um, judging 
Sometimes they make comments that they think there's overlap or it appears to be higher than the threshold, but those are sort of editorial comments. Really, their goal is to look at, is the budget consistent for the work proposed? So budget is not a determining factor. Um, this isn't like a contract where the contract goes to the lowest person bidding. Um, this, is, this is really, the budget is again, a support document to, to tell the story. That being said, you can ask for whatever you want, but don't assume because you ask for $300,000 that you're going to get $300,000. The majority of the time, if the agency is going to award your proposal, they will come back to you and say, we're gonna award your proposal, but here's what we're not interested in funding kind of thing. Sometimes they fund it as is, but very rarely. Uh, we already kind of talked about this, but the budget should uh, reflect the work proposed. Your work proposed should be consistent with the goals of the program and the phase. So if there we're going to look at budget caps for phase one in just a minute, but let's say the budget cap for phase one is 300,000, um, you can propose a budget that's slightly higher for NIH, but you cannot propose a $750,000 phase one budget because that would probably take your project beyond the scope of what phase one is, which is feasibility, short amount of time, short, a little amount of money. So make sure that your budget is consistent with the work proposed and the work proposed is within the scope of the program. And then um, I like to encourage people to start developing sort of that straw man budget early to make sure that you're going to meet the requirements of the program. And sometimes it helps us answer the question, are you going to do an SBIR or an STTR? If you're not clear on the difference, um, there are previous workshops probably available online, Shelly. I'm not sure if the FAST Center. The yeah, there of, should be, the, most of them should be available online. Okay, that kind of goes deeper into the difference between SBIR and STTR and the budget requirements. Also, Chris, uh, Deborah asked, could you clarify for her how much this applies to an NSF budget? Uh, I talked specifically about NS NSF a couple times. NSF is a really interesting character um, when it comes to their budgets. They have very particular rules. Most of them are uh, most of them are in the guidelines. They do a fairly decent job of when you read their guidelines. Every budget line item they have specific rules. But NSF is notorious for negotiating budget at time of award and making these really kind of bizarre changes. With all of the agencies, the budget, again, is not a determining factor. So you will not not get funded if your budget is a mess. Majority of the time, they if they like the science, they will come back to you and ask for edits on your budget. So the goal is to do the best you can, read the guidelines, follow the guidelines, but nine times out of 10, they're gonna come back with, with um, changes on your budget, especially NSF. Okay, so uh, let's talk about budget caps and restrictions. So always confirm budget caps and restrictions. For example, NSF has a budget ceiling of $256,000. In fact, if you propose $256,000 and $1, you will get booted out. Um, I recently helped somebody who was gonna getting ready to get funded by NSF and they wanted us to round down all of the salaries by a dollar to ensure that they didn't go over that $256,000. Taking $5 off of the budget on all the staff positions probably took me a good hour and a half. Um, so I'm not, I don't know how they calculate the, the effort versus um, the $5 difference. But anyway, it seems very important to NSF. So all agencies set a floor and a ceiling um, and so be mindful of those, read those in the guidelines and understand those. Now, if there is a floor or a ceiling, um, it's important to know that in this program, everybody comes in at the ceiling. So uh, unless you simply can't get your project there, there is no reason why you wouldn't request the full available amount of funding. Um, again, price is not a factor. So this is not a contract where you're competing for the lowest bid. Um, as long as your work matches what you ask in the budget, uh, I would ask for the maximum. And we'll talk about how to get to that point in just a minute. Uh, the budget budgets and, and uh, budget caps and restrictions are published in the solicitation and even within NIH. So even within NIH 
separate uh, funding opportunity announcements have different floors and ceilings depending on what what uh, agencies are pulling them together so again always read that solicitation okay so let's look at nsf's language so nsf suggests that's an important word right there suggests the budgets normally not exceed two hundred fifty nine thousand six hundred and thirteen dollars for phase one that's direct and indirect so that's what we call your all-in budget however NSF has received a waiver from the Small Business Administration, and they are authorized by statute to exceed those total numbers uh, for specific topics. The funding opportunity announcement gives you a link to see those uh, waiver topics. There are over 30 pages of waiter, waiver topics. And so generally speaking, you can usually find uh, a, a waiver topic that applies to your, your project. The work that most of the time goes into NIH is just expensive work. It's expensive to develop technology for use by humans. So it usually requires animal studies. Sometimes it requires clinical trials. Um, this is expensive stuff. And so um, again, the majority of the time you can, you can find a waiver topic that applies to your project. Okay, even within that, um, their language is still really murky and we're going to dive into the language next. Um, again, here, just a reminder, NSF has the $256,000 hard cap. This language that I'm about to talk about does not apply to NSF. Okay, NSF hard cap $256,000, no negotiation. Here is what NIH says in the omnibus, which is just sort of their big general uh, announcement for SBIR. Again, they talk about these costs, um, the direct and indirect that that should not ex normally may not exceed the $256,613 for phase one. They talk about the um, waiver topics and they give you the link. Then the next paragraph, they say each participating component may also set their own budget limits, which could be higher or lower. So you need to read within those topics to find out what, what they are. And then here's the really, really interesting part. So the bottom line is they talk about that you, you are encouraged to contact your program officer to discuss budgets prior to submission. But in all cases, applicants should propose a budget that is reasonable and appropriate for the completion of the research project. Okay, so the big message with NIH is don't be locked into a budget number. It's not like NSF where you have 256,000 and you're backing your way into that $256,000. For NIH, we really look at how much will it cost you to do the work proposed? Is it reasonably within range of what we see for normal NIH funding? Then we ask for it, fully knowing that at time of award, they will almost certainly come back and negotiate the budget, which means you might have to cut things. So remember in these guidelines, in the omnibus here, it says each participating component may also set their own budget limits. So here's a look at uh, National Institute of General Medical Sciences, who sets their own budget limit. So when you go read their budget language, um, they also talk about the uh, projects that may fit within the list of SBA approved waiver topics. Again, there are 30 pages of waiver topics. But then the next paragraph says that NIGMS sets its own budget limit for the certain research topics which receive a waiver to exceed the hard cap. NIGMS budget limits for phase one on approved topics is 350,000 in total cost. So this is more than some of the other waiver topics is even. So this is a higher threshold. Again, the bottom line in their budget language is in all cases, applicants should propose a budget that is reasonable and appropriate for the completion of the research project. Just another look at another institute. We're gonna look at two more. Um, this is neurological disorders and stroke. Um, this agency has uh, neurological, anything neuro has uh, a lot of funding dedicated to it right now and they have bigger budget limits. 
Um, so you can see generally they say they do not fund phase one applications greater than $700,000. So if you would have just gone with what the omnibus said, you could have put in a budget for $259,000 when up to $700,000 was available on the table. If your project cannot get to $700,000 because you're proposing a much smaller, simpler technology, do not ask for $700,000. Ask for what you need to get the work done. But the point is you have a lot more latitude um, than, you, than you did with what at first glance would appear to be the budget limit. This is a special solicitation. So this is not the omnibus, okay? This is a special solicitation uh, for mental health research. And they allow, it's still SBIR, but they allow up to $450,000 per year for phase one awards. Now to be clear, when they say that they allow up to $450,000, we're still not for NIH backing into this budget to get to exactly $450,000. Um, we are proposing work that is consistent with the phase one scope. So focused on demonstrating feasibility, small amount of time, small amount of money. So it's a, a small scope project um, that is at or near $450,000. So it, it, you don't have to come in right at 450, 455, 457, 609, whatever. Um, but it's not like those agencies that have the hard ceilings like NSF. A couple of other important points about the NIH budget information. Um, guidelines recommend that applicants contact program officers prior to submitting anything in excess of those hard caps. In my experience, first of all, would always recommend that you contact the program officer prior to submitting in general. Um, and the primary reason is you don't need permission, you, you don't need anybody's approval, um, but the goal is to build a relationship with that individual. Um, and you do that by reaching out early, sharing information about your project, trying to get some feedback on the work you propose. Then you can discuss budget. Um, have a client right now who's submitting they're submitting a phase two, um, but they're proposing what to me look like some scary percentages on the work going out the door compared to the work staying in the company. Um, and we sent it to the program officer and they didn't bat an eye. So um, that's the kind of feedback that you wanna get um, and kind of test things with the program officer prior to submission. In my experience, the majority of the time the program officers uh, response when you say that you're going to exceed the hard cap is they direct you to the SBA waivers, ask you to provide a clear argument or a case for support for that, uh, how you, your project applies to the waiver. And we do that typically in the budget justification. Um, so again, they, they don't need to grant any special permission. It's a courtesy to make them aware of budgets coming in that are gonna be over the, the limits. And the most important thing about NIH, there are those words again, applicants should propose a budget that is reasonable and appropriate for the completion of the research project. And the research project should fall within the scope of a phase one, which is focused on feasibility. Short amount of time, little amount of money. Again, doc, dollar is not a factor in review. Um, so the only question is, is the, the uh, budget requested uh, consistent and appropriate for the work proposed? And is that work within the scope and timeline of phase one? And budget, of course, is negotiated at time of award. All right, Shelly, any, any questions about those items, about budget caps? I don't have any so far. OK. All right, so let's talk about the three different types of costs that you will see in your SBIR budget. Um, and we're going to discuss them in reverse order, then we'll go through them in the, in the uh, correct order. So the first is the profit or fee. This is allowed on, by statute on all SBIRs uh, and SCTRs. Um, and, and so if you're applying for a, an other NIH mechanism, like an R01 or an R21, this line does not apply to you. You are not allowed to take a fee or profit. This is strictly reserved for the SBIR program. 
The second type of costs are indirect costs, which sometimes are called overhead or F&A. And then finally, direct costs. And so you can see below on that arrow, those costs move across a continuum of levels of restrictions. Um, the fee or profit is completely unrestricted. The indirect costs are slightly more restricted and then the direct costs are very restricted. So we're gonna go through each one of those cost categories. Direct costs, again, are the most restricted. They are costs that can be directly tied to the project. So you might say, for example, that um, Susan is going to spend 10% of her time working on this project. Well, then you would go to the budget and you would put Susan in the budget for 10% of her time. That is a direct cost. You might talk about experiments that uses glassware in your lab. Then you might ask for glassware in your budget. That is a direct expense, directly tied to the work of the project. They commonly include things like salaries and wages, materials and supplies, limited travel. Um, travel is limited in phase one to uh, um, domestic travel and travel relevant to the project. You can't do sales calls. You can't go, can't include travel to go, um, you know, do a display at a trade show, uh, but travel that's related to the project. Might include consultants or a sub award to the research institution, especially if you're doing an STTR. A fee for service. So if you're renting um, course facilities at a university, or if you're, for example, paying for uh, histology of slides, you know, 10 slides at $100 each. That's typically what we refer to as a fee for service. Um, also included in direct costs on a line, we put your TABA funds. If you're not familiar with TABA funds, every phase one applicant, and this varies by agency, so read the agency guidelines, um, is, is allowed $6,500 for technical assistance on phase one. Um, there are special categories that TABA applies to. Uh, these are things that uh, advance your company further along the commercialization process. So think about maybe you need help developing an IP strategy. Maybe you need help develop, developing your regulatory strategy. Maybe you need to hire an accountant to come in and set up a chart of accounts and get professional uh, bookkeeping software. Those are all things that would be eligible under TABA funds but depending on each agency um, handles those funds differently. So just be advised about that. <clears throat> okay, so before we talk about indirect costs, here's just a little uh, visual of how to break those costs down. So again, the direct costs are in blue. And so they include the salaries, travel, very specific to the project. The indirect costs that we're about ready to talk about are more company related expenses. And they, they can't necessarily be put in a bucket. Uh, so for example, office supplies, you stock the office supply cabinet um, and everybody gets to take what they need, but you don't bill back those supplies to the specific project. You don't say, oh, I used eight pieces of paper on my phase one. Um, that's just sort of a general company expense. Same thing with rent for your office. Rent for your office is not considered a direct expense in phase one. Um, very clearly, you do things in the company office that are not related to the phase one project. Therefore, it is not a direct expense. Um, and when we look at sort of, you know, the difference between direct and indirect costs, again, there are activities that happen in your company space that are not related to the project. Uh, and then there are activities that happen that are directly related to the project. Um, and so those would be direct costs. Things associated with conducting the experiments that you propose, those are direct costs. Things like hosting staff meetings, um, doing uh, you know, paperwork in your office, answering a phone call, those are all indirect and those cannot be billed directly to the project. So indirect costs are moderately restricted compared to the fee. Uh, and compared to direct costs. So um, again, there are these costs that cannot fit in any bucket tied directly to the project. So they're just sort of general operating. Uh, they commonly include things like your phone, your utilities, your general office supplies, um, your legal and accounting services, um, not related to intellectual property, but just sort of general operating. 
depreciation of your equipment, uh, equipment rental, health benefits, time off, all that kind of stuff is, is indirect costs. So you may or may not have an established indirect cost rate, and you may or may not have that internally and with the federal government. The federal government, if you have a lot of grants and do a lot of business with the federal government, you may have the opportunity to negotiate an overhead rate. Um, there's varying schools of thought as whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, um, but the majority of companies participating in SBIR do not yet have a federally approved indirect rate. If you're coming from a university, uh, you may be familiar with that indirect uh, rate as the majority of universities have those federally approved you know, uh, overhead rates. And they're typically anywhere from 40 to 70%. Um, so they can vary depending on the university. For small businesses that do not have an indirect rate, NIH allows you to use 40% uh, as, as a standard indirect rate. Now they do that under the assumption that you have at least calculated on a spreadsheet or something, your internal indirect rate, and that it is at least or greater than 40%. That is their assumption. Excuse me, if you haven't calculated your indirect rate, you can Google it, get some spreadsheets on how to calculate that. Um, the FAST Center may even have resources to help you calculate your, your overhead rate. Um, just Calculate it on a little back of napkin, keep it in your records, make sure you're hitting at least or above that 40% rate. If you do, you can just use NIH's 40% rate without needing further justification. Um, always ask for the indirect rate because you need that money to help continue company operations during the project. And in between phase one and phase two, you're gonna still have operating costs. So. Um, it's best to get in the habit of asking for indirect support at the very beginning. Next is the fee or profit, which is completely unrestricted. And because it's completely unrestricted, that means you should always ask for the full 7% available to you. Um, even if that means you might have to shave a little bit off of your materials or supplies or a direct cost, um, always ask for the full 7%. And the reason is because you can use this money for whatever you want. Um, and so if, if you take $200 off of your supplies um, to meet that 7% and you, you get in your experiments and you find out, man, I really needed those $200 worth of the supply, you can still use this money for the supplies. But if you don't, turns out you don't need those supplies, then you have this money available to use for anything you want, completely unrestricted. Um, it is, intended to be just that, a profit available um, to, to companies doing R&D. NSF just moved their phase two fee or profit to 10%. Um, NSF tends to be sort of the uh, front runner and a lot of, I mean, it's easy to predict the direction of the program based on some of the moves that NSF makes. And so it'll be interesting to see if other agencies start to increase that fee as the company matures into phase two. Uh, whoops, let me see if I didn't cover anything on there. Whoops. Ooh. Chris Hannah asked if you can request more than 7% profit in an age. No, no. Capped at 7%. Sometimes you will even see reviewers on your summary statements who say they asked for a fee. I don't know what that is. You know, sometimes even the reviewers aren't familiar with the profit, but it's, uh, it's allowed by statute in the program, but it is capped at 7%. Um, previously, some agencies, I think it was maybe even NSF that capped it at like 6.999%. They've switched that. Now they're all pretty much on board with the 7% fee. Okay, um, we're going to talk about some budget documents. Um, the budget is um, represented through a series of documents in your application. The first is the R&R 424, which is the actual budget form where you put the line item, put the dollars, and then it all totals up. That is in your application form. And depending on how you submit your application, depending on the agency, that will either be in grants.gov, uh, ERA Commons Assist, or um, in research.gov for NSF um, slash Fastlane. They still use Fastlane for that. 
Um, so every agency has a budget form where you do the actual calculations. That must be supported by a ju budget justification or budget narrative. And we'll look at a sample of one of those in just a second. And then you also frequently need support documentation for that. So if you are um, using a fee-for-service um, or you're you know, gonna use um, core facilities, um, you should attach a quote to, those, um, to that budget narrative to support those numbers that you ask for. Um, if you're going to use consultants um, and you've requested $3,000, there should be a letter from the consultant saying, you know, I'm going to dedicate 300 hours at $100 an hour, you know, or 30 hours at $100 an hour. Um, horrible math. Um, that needs to be in there to, to back that up. Um, so whatever the support documentation um, for the budget justification needs to be in there. If you're working with a research partner, they have sub-award documentation, which is their own separate package of the R&R &R 424. So that research institution or that, that research partner has their own budget, budget justification and support documentation. They wrap that up on a package, you attach that to your application, and then you have your own R&R &R 424. So this is a look at um, the format that I use for the NIH budget justification. You can apply this to any agency. Um, it's the same, the same format. And the format is that I literally follow exactly the forms. So when you're filling out the budget form, when you're entering your numbers, they break costs down by categories. And sometimes they say A, senior key personnel, or sometimes they say number one, key persons, whatever they say in whatever order they say, I use that as my outline. List each cost category in the budget form and then provide a narrative explanation. Now the goal here is to provide enough information that a reviewer doesn't have questions. Um, and so I feel like transparency in the budget really builds trust and it's better to overshare than undershare. So I try to provide as much detail as possible. This is probably even a little light on detail here in this example, but the goal is you provide the individual's name, uh, the salary requested, the amount of time they're dedicating to the project and their role, and then how you calculate that salary. That's what's really important is you sort of demystify the formula behind your number so that a reviewer understands how you got to a certain number. You can, oops. You can see here um, equipment. We'll talk about equipment in just a second, but there's no money requested. And so I literally put no funds requested. And so that way a reviewer knows it's not an accident um, and I don't leave those categories out. I include all categories and if funds aren't requested, I say not requested. Here's a look at the detail required for travel. Um, this is, you know, costing out every single thing they're going to do. Um, they're going to you know, make these trips to do X, Y, and Z. Um, they're gonna, here's who's traveling, here's how long they're staying. They need a hotel, they need ground transportation, they need um, airfare, whatever you determine, but you break out every single cost. Materials and supplies, this is probably, you could probably provide more detail on this on materials and supplies depending on the agency, NSF requires excruciating detail on materials and supplies. Um, this will fly at NIH for sure, but NSF requires excruciating details. These are, by the way, the cost categories for the SF424, um, which if you're using grants.gov, all agencies that use grants.gov use the SF424. And um, so that includes like USDA, for example. And what's important to remember about the um, SF or the R&R &R 424, I'm sorry. What's important to remember about that is there are cost categories on there that do not apply to the SBIR program. Um, and so you will not have funds requested in there. Those fund, the R&R &R 424 is used in a wide range of grant programs, not just SBIR. So um, it's designed to meet lots of other needs so for example, ADP computer services almost never have anything in there for SBIR. Um, alterations and renovations never have anything in there for SBIR. There are write-in lines available. I think there are three or four 
Um, that's where I typically write in fee for service. So if something is fee for service, I say what it is and um, how much it costs. And then also your TABA funds, we talked about earlier, those technical assistance funds, you use a write-in line to um, just type in on your own TABA support. And then in your budget justification, you let them know what you'll be doing with those funds. Okay, so you take all of those, those were all direct costs that we just looked at. And for example, here, they total 211,000 some change. Then next we calculate, and this is exactly how it goes on the, the um, R&R 424. Next we calculate indirect costs. Again, we're using that allowable 40% by NIH because the company doesn't have an indirect cost rate. So they take the 211 and some change and they um, multiply by 40% and this is their indirect cost. This is $84,000 that the company would be awarded to uh, support operations of the company during the project period. Then you have your total direct and indirect costs, which here is 296,000 and some change. And on top of that, we calculate the fee, the 7%. I just use this pretty standard language here that it contributes to the growth and development of the company. Um, it's consistent with profit margins for similar research and development efforts. And then um, you can see here, <laughs> At the bottom, I typically just do a, you know, a really clear statement of the total budget. Um, I'm based in Indiana, and in Indiana, we have a matching grant program for phase one awards, so I share that information here with the reviewers. It's not included in any of the budget calculations, but if you have a matching program, either within your institution or within your state, or if you have been granted matching funds by somebody else, share that information here. Again, not included in your budget, but just included. And then I like to do a table um, to break down the percentages to allow reviewers to quickly see that you meet the requirements, depending on if you're doing SBIR or STTR, that you meet the requirements of the, re the percentage effort. So I typically just do a table that shows how much money is going to the company and how much money is going to the subaward, and then by percentage as well. Chris, going back to the personnel, Deborah asked if you need to have names for uh, people that you haven't hired yet that you'll be hiring with the grant. Great office. question. Great question. So um, yes and no. It depends on what category. So senior key personnel are people who are going to contribute to the science of the project. These are typically people who are um, who have scientific or technical expertise that um, you know you couldn't do the project without. Um, one other caveat or, or um, way to distinguish is folks that are listed in C senior key personnel, we attach a bio sketch. So if you have somebody that you want reviewers to know what kind of experience or knowledge they have and you want to share their bio sketch, then I would put them in the senior key persons section. It is not a good idea to have unnamed people in that category. In the other personnel category, which are sort of more technical people or um, you know, project-based people, um, it's easier. Now, I did just have a summary statement come back where somebody said, um, oh, they don't, they haven't named, they haven't named the, you know, the engineer or something. That's going to take time, you know, um, to, to locate that person. And I try to, as you can see in here, um, I try to add language to assure reviewers that those types of positions can quickly be hired. Um, here I say NUCO is um, qualified, they can confident they can find a qualified applicant because they're located in Bloomington, Indiana, which is home to Indiana University, a rich startup community focused on software and hardware. So I try to reassure reviewers if you don't know that person by name that you can quickly hire them. Sometimes you include there what kind of qualifications that person would have, you know, that you're going to seek a, a developer with three years of relevant experience or if you have leads or use some other sort of feeder system to find those people, I would include information. Not a great idea to not name senior key persons, not life or death for other personnel, but a reviewer might just make a comment, but they make comments about all kinds of things, so. Okay, here's a look at what the budget looks like um, as far as numbers once we line it all up. Um, if you were to th kind of think about this on the 424, the 424 is a very long form. And when you try to drop it in slides, it's impossible to read. So it's easier to just do a table. 
Um, but this shows you each line item and the way we calculate it. Um, and then again, we have the subtotal, which is the total direct cost. You add your 40% on top of that, and then you add um, that together, and then you add your fee on top of that. Now, there is um, sometimes when people calculate indirect costs, uh, there are a couple of different ways to do this. And if, again, you're at an institution, you may see that they frequently use uh, a modified total direct cost uh, to calculate their indirects. Modified means that um, in that case, you're not requesting it on the full total direct cost. You're pulling something out. Uh, sometimes that might be um, graduate student remissions on, on a research proposal, but on a small business proposal, it might be, for example, let's say you uh, only ask for indirects on the first, you know, 25,000 of a sub award. You can do that and some agencies will require you to do that. However, for NIH, that's not required. Um, you can request that 40% on the total budget. You do not have to use a modified total direct cost. And the reason is because NIH uh, operates under the assumption that no matter how big that subaward is, you will still have uh, indirect cost associated with managing that, that uh, subaward. So you don't have to use a total modified direct cost. Okay, so questions. Um, yeah, Joseph was just asking about um, who to contact for within our state for uh, matching uh, grants for SBIR, STTR. He said he's not in Indiana. I'm not sure if you are in Illinois, Joseph, but um, Illinois has just approved a matching program. However, it's just recently approved and they haven't released any of the details of how to apply yet. The FAST Center will make that information available to our entire um, email list as soon as that information is released. That's fantastic news. That is great news. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's great. Do you know what level it'll be at? Any, we don't have any of the details of the program available yet, but okay. as soon as they're released, we'll get that out to everybody. It's up, up to $50,000 in match and it's only on phase one awards. But, oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. That's fantastic. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, sort of how do you start drafting your budget? And as I mentioned, I recommend um, that that kind of happens early. For, for me, the order of the process is typically, you know, we sort of talk about specific aims and draft the specific aims. And, and for me, the specific aims drive the budget. Um, so once we have the specific aims, then we can sort of sit down and say, okay, here are your aims what team members are going to do these? What partners do you need to help you accomplish these aims? And that's where we can sort of start to do the straw man budget on the back of the napkin. We can look at if you say, um, oh, uh, well, we just today, I was just before this call talking to somebody who has a, a research team coming in from University of Maryland and what's their role gonna be? Well, they're gonna provide access to data. Okay, well, that's not, you know, and they might sit in on a couple of meetings. Okay, well, that, that's probably gonna be a small percentage of the budget. So in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, we can probably go SBIR there. Now, if they came back and said, you know, for example, another project where they say, oh, you know, we're developing the technology and then we're gonna hand it over to our research partner and they're going to run a clinical trial, um, you know, double blind study on the, on the technology, that's a huge part of the budget. And I'll know right away, that's gonna to have to be an STTR. So that sort of starts the budget process, sort of looking at the specific aims or the proposed work and outlining what the team looks like. And then we kind of calculate the percentages and the split. And that, that uh, determining that, that split up front is really important because if you're gonna work with a research partner, the very first question they're gonna ask you is how much money do we have available? And if you are going to work with a research partner and you say, um, you know, you kind of do your straw man budget and you're like, okay, it looks like we can afford to send $70,000 to the university. And you tell the university that they have $70,000 available, the university will come back spending $70,000. So it's really important upfront that you understand sort of that split um, of the work proposed to determine again, SBIR, STTR and um, the, the workload. And then, um, you know, we, too, we do kind of want to back into the agency targets and categories. We're not backing directly into like an NSF 
where we start with the 256 because we know it's a cap. But we do back in in the general sense of, okay, you know, the typical, for me, the typical phase one that I'm putting in right now is about 315,000. Um, and so if I know the typical phase one is about 315,000 and somebody drafts up aims and we do a straw man budget and the budget's 178,000, okay, they're not, they're probably not proposing competitive enough work. So we need to go back and look at the scope of work to see if they can sort of um, increase the level of what they're proposing to be more competitive. Similarly, if they come back with the straw man and the budget is 535,000, we're gonna say, okay, wait a minute, like you gotta cut something that's beyond the scope of a phase one. So how can we sort of um, work backwards on that project and cut something to be more in, in line with the, the agency? Um, and again, if you're gonna work with that university, not only will they wanna know how much is available, but you gotta engage them right away because there's a whole lot of work that goes on on the backside of the university when you're partnering with a research institution. Their budgets must be routed and approved, um, which usually requires a minimum of a five day process within their institution. Plus it takes them a while to generate that, that um, budget information. You need their budget information because you literally plug it into your budget information. Um, and so if you need your budget information by done by August 1st, you better engage that subaward partner by July 10th in order to get what you need. Um, so just sort of plan ahead for that process. All right, a, a couple of quick notes about some of those direct costs that you saw on the that are the budget categories. Uh, equipment is typically not allowed in phase one, definitely not allowed from NSF in phase one. Um, and NSF doesn't even like you to, uh, sometimes with NIH, <laughs> we can kind of circumvent that. And if there's a piece of equipment that somebody really wants, we can say, oh, it's $4,999. And you know, we might be able to make it work in um, materials and supplies. NSF will not go for that. So. Um, nothing that appears to be equipment for phase one and NSF. Now, um, that equipment is defined as a single item valued at over $5,000 with a life longer than one year. And so, um, for example, a laptop is not equipment. A laptop is materials and supplies. An autoclave is equipment. Um, so kind of a big difference there. I talked about travel costs, domestic only related to the project. I do use the GSA travel schedule to come up with uh, travel costs. Some agencies require you use the GSA. Sometimes I've even had to link to where I, I got the information on the GSA. Similarly, um, National Science Foundation requires that you use Department of Labor wages. Um, and if you are going to get funded, you have to provide links to the, to the wages that you use to calculate uh, salaries for, for employees. So, there are a lot of uh, government related resources to sort of substantiate your costs and you can certainly always use those. Materials and supplies are consumable, um, typically disposed of in less than a year, valued at under $5,000 per item and they should be related to the project. Um, so not really office supplies, but you could say general lab supplies. You know, sometimes we ask for just general glassware for the lab, you know, like $1,000 or something but you should provide as much detail as possible, enough, as much breakdown as possible related to um, cost per item, number of items requested, and then the total. Um, some unallowable expenses on SBIR, STTR, we're talking about any kind of filing fees, FDA, intellectual property filing fees, no filing fees are allowed, uh, no um, overt legal fees. And this is the same, you, you can't use your TABA funds for these filing fees either. You can use your TABA or technical assistance funds to help develop, for example, a strategy around your IP, but you can't use those funds to then file the IP. Uh, no marketing expenses, PR, trade shows. Um, I once saw, you know, like the development of a trade show booth in a budget for SBIR, not allowed. Um, no, no overtly commercialization activities, overt commercialization activities. Here's a list of what TABA funds are designated to be used for making better, better technical decisions, solving technical problems, which um, come up during the project, minimizing technical risk, developing and commercializing new products and processes, 
uh, including intellectual property um, protection. But again, no filing fees. Um, just general comments about the budget. Um, the budget is a projection. Um, it is not a purchase order. So this is not that you um, submit the proposal and then complete the work while the proposal is getting reviewed and then request reimbursement. It is not a reimbursement-based program. You can start the work um, if you think you're gonna get funded uh, for NIH, you are allowed up to 45 days, what's called pre-award spending. Um, it's at your own risk um, and it varies at, at, by institute at NIH. Um, I, I, personally, I would say that I would never assume that you're going to get funded until you literally have the notice of award in your hand. No matter what the agency tells you, no matter how much documentation you submit until you have that letter in your hand. Um, you are still at risk of not being funded at any time. And then um, certainly ask for help. Um, the Every institute in NIH, Institute or Center, has a grants manager officer and a program officer. Um, the program officer is who you talk to about your technical issues. The grants management officer is who you might talk to about things related to budget. Copy both of them on your emails to keep everybody informed. And then hire professionals. Um, I highly recommend that you know you you get accountants or qualified bookkeepers who have experience with federal grants to help keep things in order. Questions? Uh, we have a question from Hannah. She said, "So should we use the Department of Labor Statistics wages as opposed to the actual labor's wages, their actual employee salaries?" For NIH, use the actual salaries. Um, NIH does not require that, that level of, of um, detail. Honestly, for NSF, I would still use the actual, but be prepared that when they come back, if they're gonna fund the grant, they're going to ask you to provide labor and they may require you to pay that position at the, the labor rates, Bureau Department of Labor rates, yeah. But I would still ask for, again, because the budget is not, you, you need to ask for what you need and then let them negotiate. Really good, Chris. I think we addressed, Shelley, the question on the budget for phase one, 150,000 versus 274,000. Just wanted to make sure we got that as well. Yeah, I think we addressed that. Okay. Great. Otherwise, thank you very much, Chris, for your presentation. Thank you. And thank you for all those that attended. See you next month.